All right, welcome. My name is Ryan Holger. I'm with Temperature Equipment Corporation. I'm one of our trainers over here. Um, this week's webinar uh, residentially is on Gizmo's Home Energy Auditor Tool. Uh, the commercial webinar is on the 23XRV machine, so hopefully you are on the correct webinar today. We do have two going on simultaneously. Uh, I'm going to walk you through just two or three slides here on this software, and then we're actually going to jump in and actually use the software and log into it, because that will be significantly more interesting than me showing you pictures of it on slides. Um, so the first thing is this is part of a suite of tools that TEC offers to Bryant and Carrier dealers uh, that do business with TEC in the Chicago land and surrounding areas. Um, the four main tools that are kind of built into this thing are Gizmo, which some of you probably have heard that name before. We also use that name generically to encompass the whole suite of tools that we're talking about today. Uh, that was the original tool. It's a, it's a proposal generator tool. Some of you probably do, do use it for your stuff in your office there. Um, you basically drag a uh, drag piece of equipment onto a little worksheet and it builds your proposal based on whatever you drug it in there. So you can search for the specific furnace or AC or accessory you want and drag it all into one sheet and it'll build a proposal for you. Uh, the second tool in that suite is something we call Super Sprocket. And what this really is is a website widget that dealers install on their own website. Uh, and consumers can see that on their website. There'll be a little link that says see my energy savings or something like that. And they can plug in their address and by putting their address in there, that little tool goes out and finds information about that homeowner's house based on tax records and stuff like that, kind of like the Zillow website. Uh, but it finds that information, your square footage, when it was constructed, and things like that, and uses that to estimate what potential energy savings they might have by upgrading their furnace and AC and so forth. So it uses the address information to get square footage and home age to, to take guesses at the insulation. Uh, and use the address also for the zip code for the weather data and things like that. So it's a pretty cool tool. It's, a tool. it's fairly accurate. Uh, and then the homeowner um, can also, they're punching in their address obviously, but they can also punch in a little more information like their phone number and email address if they choose to. And you can follow up with them to help them implement some of these savings ideas the little tool gives them. It's very quick. takes like one minute to use. It's fantastic. Uh, and it, that same address search finder tool is what we use in the other tools here in a minute. Uh, the third tool as part of that suite is the load calculator tool. Uh, it works the same way as the super sprocket except it's for the dealer and not something that's posted on the website for the consumer. Uh, so you can put in the consumer's address information. It does the same little simple analysis that the super sprocket does by getting the homeowner's tax information and square footage and all that stuff from the internet. Uh, but then you can go in and tweak things like, oh, I know they have this insulation or they added this addition on or whatever they did. Um, and you can tweak that stuff and use it to do your manual J calculation. The engine running in the background is the ACA manual J formulas, uh, so it's basically equivalent to that. Uh, so some of you probably do use this already, and if you don't, you may start using it, because uh, hopefully you all realize on the first of the year, for the state of Illinois anyway, uh, manual J load calculations are statewide required on all projects, both new construction as well as replacement equipment. So if you change somebody's furnace out, as part of the energy code compliance, you have to submit a manual J calculation for that home. This is one way to do that. Uh, and the fourth item in that suite of tools is what we call energy auditor, or sometimes we call it home auditor, um, just depending on who you're talking to. Um, and that's what we're going to work on today and show you. And it works with that same address finder to get some basic data. Uh, we basically get to do, we're basically going to do two manual J calculations in that tool, one for their current house and one for the house with the proposed upgrade that we're going to offer them. So that's what we're going to spend our time on today. The idea being, if you see how this energy auditor works, you kind of got the idea of how the load calculator and other tools work. It's really the same kind of thing. Uh, here are the key sites. I also put them on the, uh, on the chat box for you on the go to meeting service. Uh, so depending on whether you're a carrier or Bryant dealer, uh, you would either log in at carrier.virtualhvac.com or bryantvirtualhvac.com. Um, that's what I'm going to do here in a minute. Uh, if you do not remember your login or you've never had one in the past, but you are a Carrier and Bryant dealer that works with TEC, uh, Drew Bolsega is the contact and he can set you up with it or, or, or uh, reset your password if you forgot it. Uh, and then if you have questions on you know, how to navigate the site and things like that um, while you're doing it, they do have a technical support number uh, that you can call and they can walk you through some stuff like that. All right, so with that being said, instead of showing you slides of it, we're actually going to go ahead and log into it. If you guys have questions as we're going, just do me a favor and type them in the question uh, chat box there, and I'll pay attention to that every 10 minutes or so and look over at it to see if there's any questions we can answer uh, live here. 
All right, so here I am in my web browser. Uh, I have the carrier one opened up. The Bryant and carrier ones are basically the same thing. You're just logging in as a different dealer, and some of the logos will be different, stuff like that. But as far as how they navigate and so forth, it's all the same. So I'm going to log in as me, and it remembers my password from last time. All right, now in my case, it gives me a choice to carry or Bryant because I had them set me up both ways so I can show dealers how these things work. Uh, but based on the people that are logged in right now, it looks like we got more carrier than Bryant guys, so I'm just going to use that one. And I know no matter what, I'm guessing wrong, and half the people won't be happy. But it all looks, looks and works the same here. Now, the thing I'm going to tell you, too, is I'm running this. Uh, this is an online software tool, so it's not something you install on your computer. It's running through a website. Uh, but I'm also running the, the webinar service through, through my computer at the same time. And both of these things are fairly bandwidth intensive. So it's going to be a little bit slower than if I, was, if I didn't have the webinar going and I was just logging in straight up. Um, so I'll just let you know that in advance. Uh, the other thing is the software company does recommend that you use Firefox as your web browser. Um, I happen to be using Internet Explorer. I've had no problems with it. For some reason, they just don't like Internet Explorer. So if you talk to them on the support line, they may encourage you to do that. If your IT folks let you, great. If not, then just keep using Internet Explorer. I've not had any issues with it. Um, so when you first log in, you'll see something like this. It defaults you into the gizmo tool, which is the proposal generator. You can punch in model numbers and stuff like that. It'll give you a list of equipment down below. Probably already has a default list here. I can drag that equipment up into my little box and start building my proposal. So that's a different software tool for, for a different time there. And you can set up some of the preferences and, and baselines and weather data and things like that that go along with some of these tools. The super sprocket one up here on top that I got highlighted, uh, that guy there is to set up the defaults related to the widget that you would put on your website. So you have to set up these details, basically, whose email address at your company do you want the lead sent to kind of thing, um, you know, what state are you in and what's your, what zip code so that way it gets the right weather data, stuff like that, um, and, and utility costs. Uh, but that's also for another day. Uh, here's how you get to the load calculator software. Um, that I just mentioned a little bit ago. And then over here is the energy auditor. So that's the one we're going to work on right now. I'm going to click on that guy. Now right now these tools are all separate individual tools. So it is asking me to go ahead and log in again with the exact same login I just used. That's going to go away in the future here and it's all going to be um, linked together under one login. But for the moment right now, because this was under development, um, it's a separate tool, but it's going to be linked all with the same gizmo thing in a little while here. Uh, on the right side here before I click login, there are some downloads you can do um, to get some compliance statements. Um, so if you're trying to, to get someone uh, for State of Illinois Energy Code to accept this as your manual J calculation, here's a, you know, this bottom one here, view IECC compliance certification. That's basically a letter saying that this is equivalent to a manual J calculation. So if you needed something like that, you could get that. Uh, we're going to go ahead and log in. All right, so once again, to ask me which brand, because I am set up for dual brands, you won't see that screen normally. Um, so I already got my information on here, how I'm set up. So I'm, this is how I set mine up as me, basically, uh, and my address and phone number. You just got to set that up once. Um, some of the other things you can do down here, if, if you are doing an audit for someone's home and you happen to be you know, a BPI certified individual, you can check that box. All that's going to do is on the final reports at the end, is add that logo onto that report. Um, so I'm not BPI, so I'm not going to check it, but if you were or if you were Nate or whatever, you can do it. I'm lead and I'm ASHRAE, so I'll check those boxes. If your company is an ACA member, you can check that one. If you are an energy um, certified HVAC contractor and HQUIDO, you can check that one. If you're a, you know, a ResNet rater, you can check that one. Uh, so depending on, on what you are. But I'm going to check my two and I'm going to click update just so my settings are in there. All right, so now mine are defaulted to be on there. All right, as far as the audit goes, we start over here on the right side here. Um, you can uh, choose from one of your most recent ones by clicking that drop-down box um, and then hitting go. You can also click view all and see all of your proposals and see whether they were a load calc or an energy uh, audit or what they were. In our case, we're just going to start fresh here. I'm going to type in an address. I'm going to put in my actual own house because, well, because that's what I always use for an example because I know all the information about it. Um, but if I was doing a consumer's house, I'd put there in, go in. So let's just say it's Joe Homeowner. And this information I hear on the bottom is just going to show up on the report. So if you don't have it or if you don't want it on there, you don't have to do it. Um, the, the main info that you have to have is the address and the zip code. Those are the two things you have to have. It doesn't ask you for the city. 
because if it has the zip code, it basically knows the city. Um, so then what I can do is I can I can do different tools down here, but we're sticking with the home energy audit for today. Like I said, if you understand that one, the other ones all make a lot of sense. So I'm not going to go to the load calculator. I'm going to go to the home uh, home auditor button. So like I said, what it does, and let's see if we can make this a little bit bigger for today's purposes. Get a little more screen surface area here. So here's the homeowner's house in Aurora. Uh, here's the guy's name, which is me in this case. Uh, if I want to start over on a new one, I can click start a new proposal, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to work with this guy right here. Uh, so it gave me some basic data here. Uh, if you scroll down, it calculated that I got 2,836 square feet. It's a little bit off. Um, I'm assuming that I know the inside of my house is square foot. I don't know the outside, so maybe it's just not counting the wall, insulation, and stuff like that. But if you want to adjust it, you can just slide it. So I know that mine is uh, 2690, and I'm, I'm anal, so I tweaked it. I don't know if you could see over there, but these graphs were moving up and down on the right. Uh, there's two graphs here. There's one for the exposure diversity uh, that I'm going to get, basically, you know, caused by the sun load and so forth. And I got one for my actual heating and cooling loads. If I hold my mouse over it, at any given point on one of these curves, it tells me my heating and cooling loads at that given month. And then these straight lines, the pink and blue straight lines along the top, those are my heating and cooling loads uh, for my load calculations. So right now it's based on what I have clicked on here. It's saying it's 76,000 BTUs heating, 48,000 BTUs cooling are my uh, you know annual load calcs. Uh, and then for my operating load for October, so that I don't need any cooling, and I need 34,000 BTUs in October. So it's doing these little load calcs for us here in the background as part of this whole energy audit. As I tweak stuff on some of these settings, it's going to change these loads, obviously. So the first thing I can tweak is I got to pick which direction my house has the most glass. Um, unfortunately for me, mine's pretty, it's exactly even square, square footage of glass from east and west. So it's kind of for, excuse me, southeast and northwest. Um, but I'm just going to take a guess at it, and I'm going to say that southeast has the bigger glass load, even though I know northwest is identical. But northwest is the side of the house that we never use, dining room and stuff like that. So I don't care about it as much. So I'm going to pick the southeast as my main glass exposure. Um, it's taking a guesstimate at um, the square footage of my windows on each side of the house. I can change that if I want to. Uh, I don't have to accept those numbers. This is just the default that it took. So if I have gone around and measured the windows of this person's house, I can go in and enter the square footage numbers for each section of their house. This is fairly close to what I have, so I'm going to leave it alone and leave it, leave it as is. Uh, but you can see that also affected my load calcs. So now I'm at 76,000 BTUs heating, 51,000 BTUs cooling. Um, so these things are going to get tweaked as we go here. If I would have picked over here on the northwest side, you should see my heating and cooling loads change again. Right, so now I'm 76,000 heating, 51,000 cooling. So you can see the effect of moving, moving some of these values on your loads as they're happening. And this right now is doing the loads on my existing house. Um, Every once in a while, you'll do a house address, and it'll come up with 1,700 square feet. Uh, that's the default number that it's going to pick if it cannot find any information on this person's house. So you still need to do a reality check and make sure this is finding the house. But if for some reason there's no updated tax records or the house was just built a couple months ago or something like that, uh, you're not going to be able to find it in the database. Uh, so it's not going to have all the data. So it'll say 1,700 square feet. As soon as you see that, either they really do have exactly 1,700 square feet, which is not likely, or it didn't find it, and you need to go make sure, double check all the values to make sure everything's right. Um, that's how my house used to show up years ago on this tool, but now it's all in the database. Um, you can tell it when it was built. Mine was built in the early 2000s, so I'm good there. That's basically going to take a guesstimate at some of my wall construction values. I can go and tweak those values uh, in detail later on, which I'll show you how to do that. But this is just going to give me a first stab at it. Uh, I got a question from Chris asking how the default window area is calculated. I'm assuming how did it come up with these numbers here, the 195, 27, and so forth, Chris. Um, I don't know where it got those from. Um, it's not based on the actual house data, I don't think. Um, I'm not really sure how it got those. They're fairly close, though. Uh, obviously, you can change them to be more specific, but I'll have to ask the software guys where they're pulling that data from specifically. I don't think they're getting that from like the Zillow type website. I don't think it has that information in there. Um, so I'll find out where that's coming from. Um, in other case, you want to do want to make sure it's right. I'm not saying you got to get a tape measure and go around and measure every single window, but usually you can measure one window. You, they're usually the same size, and then you can just count all the rest to make sure it's fairly accurate. 
uh, but I'll find out where the software guys are pulling the initial data from because this does change with every house that I put in here. So it's getting initial data from somewhere. Yeah, Rod's making a comment and saying that it's a percentage, a percentage of the total wall area in the house, which is probably accurate, Rod. But Chris's question is, how do they know how much is on the northwest versus northeast versus southwest, etc.? So I'm not sure how they're figuring that out, but we'll find that answer. Uh, Jessica's asking about shading. Uh, there's a shading percent over here. So if the house has uh, awnings that are blocking a certain percentage of the windows, you can punch that percentage in here. Um, most of the houses that I've been dealing with so far, modern houses, don't seem to have any shading at all. But if you're in an older neighborhood that has awnings, you can do that. Or if they got you know huge oak trees in their front yard, um, you can put a percentage factor in there um, to do to handle that kind of thing. Very similar to other other software tools, other uh, like load calc type software tools. Um, so that's giving me some basic data on here. Uh, I picked how old my house was, in this case 2000, what kind of fuel source I have. It defaults to natural gas, but if this is a propane customer or electric or whatever, you can change that and pick one of these other values. Uh, same with the water heating. I got natural gas defaulted here, but I could have picked something else, propane or electric or whatever I have. Um, the next thing that you can do is you can calibrate this whole model by adjusting the consumer's utility bill. So down here it's saying that my heating load is, uh, my operating heating load is 73,000 BTUs per hour. My cooling is 52,000 BTUs per hour. This is how much it's costing me to run those things. Um, so I can do a couple of different things here. If I look over here and look at some of these bills, like say they give me their July bill, and it's a fairly representative July. It's not some, you know, weird freakish July where we had no heat. And I can come over here and look at it and say, oh, your July bill was X amount of dollars. And you say, that's not right. Uh, what I can do at that point in time is I can use these slide bars over here to tweak it if I want to. If I move those over, you see the curve above me changed out, or I can move it back. Um, so you can do that. If they give you a couple of their bills, you can tweak those specific ones, and it's going to move the peak and obviously adjust the curve of each of these, um, these analyses. I like to personally leave it alone, and then I go in and put in all of the exact information about this person's house, um, like you know what I know in terms of uh, individual insulation values on walls and things like that. And then I come back and see how close I am to the utility bill. But if you're just being uh, lazy and trying to do something really quick, you can adjust to here. You could scroll down to the answers and be done. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not the guy who likes to do the shortcut way. I like to do it a little bit longer way. So you could literally be done. You could have put the address in, made sure the square footage and construction was right, and said, okay, sounds good. Scroll down to the bottom and came down and told them, hey, here's how much you're using. If we do some of these measures, you'll save this much energy. Um, but we're not going to do that today. We're going to do it a little bit longer way. It's still going to be fast, but it'll be a little bit longer. We're going to punch in some extra data. So here's the, the four things I can change. The fuel rates, the advanced data, which we'll spend most of our time, and I can put combustion testing data on here. The combustion testing before and after I make improvements to the home, uh, mainly air sealing improvements, that just is something that shows up on their port because some uh, utility programs and things like that require it. Uh, but it has no effect on the uh, energy savings. The combustion analysis doesn't. But the fuel rates and the advanced settings do, so we're going to look at those. So under fuel rates, I can see here right now it's defaulting me to $0.10 cents for electric, both in summer and winter. I'm going to change that to $0.12, cents, um, which is the current approximate ComEd price when you take all of your uh, monthly fuel costs for electricity and average it with everything in there. So all the account fees and distribution charges and those kind of things, taxes, all built in. If you divide the kilowatt hours by the dollars, excuse me, divide the dollars by the kilowatt hours, right now it's been averaging 12 cents. And that's been pretty consistent for three or four years. The gas rate, however, has not been very consistent. Uh, if you looked at it four years ago, it was about a buck seven. Uh, right now we are about 68 to 70 cents, once again, with all the taxes, fees, distribution charges included. So I've been using 80 cents lately uh, on my estimates on stuff. Um, kind of a compromise between the current 70 cents and the previous dollar plus number. Uh, I don't know what propane is these days, but we didn't check the propane box. But I think propane is probably around 250, and oil is probably around four. But you could change those. Um, if you want that to become your default, you can click set as default. So I did that. So next time I bring it up, it should have those numbers in there. I will, won't have to change them until gas prices change. All right, so let me see if we've got any other questions right now. Looks like we do not have any at the moment. So I'm going to expand the Advanced tab here. Uh, and this is where I can put in additional information about this home if I, if I know additional information about the home. There's two columns here. There's the house and the spec. 
The house is basically what do these people have right now in their house that I know what they have. The spec is what am I specifying to, for them to do to improve this. So as we go through these, sometimes I might be telling them, hey, put better insulation in. Other times I may, I may be saying put a better furnace in. We'll go through some of these one by one here to give you an idea of how they work. Um, so, you know, in my house we got four people with one on the way, so we'll change that to five. Um, electricity usage. Uh, this is electricity usage that doesn't relate to cooling, so this is a very tough value to figure out. Um, I'm going to make them both the same for right now because all the improvements I'm going to talk to these people about are going to be related to HVAC because I work for an HVAC distributor. So I'm not going to tell them about putting in a, a new refrigerator or whatever. But if I was, I could account for that here if I was telling them to do some other Energy Star appliances and stuff like that. But I'm just going to leave them the same. So for the purpose of our analysis, it's irrelevant. Um, we're just going to look at how much I'm going to improve it by. Um, as far as the indoor conditions, I got summer and winter indoor conditions. So in my house, in the summer, I'm at 78. I'm presumably going to operate it the same way. Uh, outdoor, somewhere outdoor, it's pulling what our, um, our ASHRAE bin data is for this area. And 89 degrees, uh, if you look at the, there's different columns that you can look at depending on, uh, on you know, whether you're trying to do 99%, 99.5% of the time kind of thing. But 89 is our correct value. And I believe when you start doing load calculations for the state, they're going to be looking for that 89 number to be on there, not the 95 that a lot of us have defaulted to over the years. Um, I've usually done like 92 as my number, um, just kind of a compromise between the 95 you guys always ask me for and the 89 that the ASHRAE fundamentals told me to do. But whatever the number is, I'm going to leave it at 89 because that's probably the right number. Uh, I'm going to leave that alone. Uh, and I can plug in what I got for my indoor temperatures, whatever they happen to be. My outdoor winter design is 3 degrees. I know a lot of you guys designed for minus 10. Um, if you start doing that, you're probably going to get flagged by the state. I think we are minus 3 here. So I'm going to put that in for this purpose right now. Uh, I'm going to stay on natural gas system, but if I was going from a natural gas and I was going to offer them a heat pump instead or a dual fuel system, I could pick that. But right now I'm going to keep it simple with natural gas. These folks have an 80% furnace. I'm going to propose they put in a 97% highest tier furnace just because. Uh, the heat pump one's not going to matter because I didn't pick heat pump or dual fuel. But if I did, I can plug in the new values for that. So I could plug in whatever that guy was going to be. Actually, for right now, I'll just leave it down here at 7 just so that way you guys all feel good about it. But it doesn't really matter unless I pick uh, one of these heat pump choices or the dual fuel choice. But if I make them both the same, then it, you know for sure in your mind it's irrelevant. Uh, the COP goes along with that as well. Uh, SEER, uh, currently there's 14 SEER there. And you see when I change the SEER, it's changing the EER. As most of you probably know, there is no direct translation between SEER and EER. There's no magical formula because the rate, the testing system is different. EER is done at full load. Uh, how much power did I buy versus how much cooling effect did I get? Whereas SEER is a... Uh, biased calculation based on some seasonal efficiencies that AHRI calculations assume and some cycling losses and things like that. So it's not a direct correlation between SEER and EER, but for the purposes of this software, they've kind of made it so you can tweak one and it'll adjust the other. It used to just say EER on here, so if you were a user of this software a year ago, you had to know the EER, the unit, which most of us did not have memorized, but the SEER we knew pretty well. Uh, so right now, I've got 14 SEER in there. Let's say I'm going up to a 16 SEER, just for sake of this discussion. Uh, the sensible heat ratio, I'm going to leave those both the same for this purpose. Um, but the sensible heat ratio is basically how much sensible versus latent energy performance am I going to get out of my cooling system. Cooling system meaning the condenser, the evaporator, and the fan system working together. 25% um, latent and 75% sensible is pretty common. Sometimes you might have 80% sensible, 20% latent. Uh, if their system was grossly oversized, you may have accidentally made your system behave much differently. And maybe their current system is grossly oversized, and maybe it's doing almost no latency. Maybe you want to put a 0.9 in there, and then when you downsize it, maybe you put the correct 0.75. I'm going to leave it 0.75 on both for right now. So those are the adjustments I can make on HVAC. So basically, I got their basic weather data information here. And the only thing I'm telling you what I'm going to do is go from an 80 to a 97% furnace and a 14 to 16 SEER air conditioner in this case. Uh, I can also go up at this point and check and see how much that's affected my heating and cooling loads. 
So you can see as I told it had a slightly better um, cooling system, uh, or excuse me, uh, weather data set points. Instead of having it set for 75, I think it was, I said I got 78. So that's adjusted my cooling load down. Uh, my heating set points I lowered too, so my heating load changed, right? So if I didn't, if I left it where it was at 75, and went up, looked at my heating, my cooling load, it went back up a little bit. So these guys are directly affecting the load in real time. So I can see how these things are affecting. There's only 2,000 BTUs, but I can see that effect there nonetheless. All right, so the next section, Han, session down, section down here is on HVA system efficiency. I should also mention, too, there are note fields you can put here. So if I was tweaking something here, I can put in the notes, whatever I was doing. So later on in the report, that stuff will show up. Put that on there so we can see it in the report later so we remember why we did that. Um, HVA system, system efficiency, this would be if you're improving uh, the duct system. So if you were doing like, um, I don't know, like some aero seal for the duct or something like that, you can tweak some of these values. Um, for today's purposes, we're just going to leave them the same. Let's say we're not fixing the duct work. We're going to keep the same duct work they have with pretty average uh, efficiency losses on here. If I had... Um, directly ducted ventilation air. So if I had like um, uh, just an, one of those outside air ducts coming into the back of my furnace or something like that, uh, I can add that in here. Or if I had nothing and now I'm going to start adding it, I can start plugging in those values here. See, I'm going to bring 100 CFM in or whatever it is. All right, for right now, I'm going to leave it at zero and zero for ventilation air, for mechanical ventilation air. Uh, under the water heater section, all I basically have to do is tell it my fuel, which I already told it was natural gas. Uh, sometimes you might have a natural gas furnace, an electric water heater or something, but usually it's going to be the same deal. Uh, so what's my current water heater? I believe it is a 0.57, I believe is what I have. And I'm probably not going to put a 93% condensing water heater in. But let's say I put in an Energy Star water heater, which I believe is a 6.75. I can also punch it in here. Um, so let's say that's what I have. Make it 67. Um, the windows, um, if you're going to put new windows in or if you have better data for what their current windows are, you can plug that in. So if you know the U value of the windows they own currently. Now, in some cases, you're going to have houses that are going to have really good windows on the addition, but they're going to have really crappy windows on the existing house. For the purpose of this software, you're not to just take an educated guess on averaging between them. Uh, you don't it's not like a, like a full load calc software where you're going to go in and build each individual wall assembly. Um, that's both the good and bad about this software, by the way. Um, if you've never used regular software for load calculations or energy modeling like this, um, you probably dreaded building the wall and saying, okay, I got this brick veneer, and then I got this uh, you know, uh, vapor barrier, then I got plywood, then I got an air gap. Then I got insulation, then I got drywall, and you know, it's a pain in the butt to build all that wall and tell it the U values of each of those components. So this is just doing one U value for the, all the windows, and you'll see in a little bit one R value for all the walls. Um, so it's kind of just an average thing. You'll see as you play with it, it has um, minimal effect uh, if I said one window was worse than all the rest or something like that. Um, but if you did, you can kind of bring the average down. So I can adjust the U value, and I can adjust the solar heat gain. For right now, I'm going to leave these both the same. I'm assuming they're not doing a window project because I'm an HVAC guy. But if I was doing a, a more com comprehensive analysis for them or they saw they had really crappy windows, I told them they can get some better windows from my favorite window guy and share leads with him or whatever, I can put, I can put that factor in here and they can see the improvement of that. Um, down here on the insulation side, uh, average ceiling height, 8.5 feet. That's pretty fair. My, my house is... Uh, Nine foot on the first floor, eight on the second floor, so eight and a half is a pretty fair guess. Um, the wall insulation is pretty far off. Um, my walls are currently R30, so I'm going to tweak those. Um, Ten for the floor value is probably pretty fair. Uh, it's basically concrete in the basement with uh, padding and carpet, so that's probably a pretty fair number. Um, I'm sorry, my walls are R19. R30 would have been awesome. I don't have that. Um, but my ceiling value is R30. So I know those values I tweaked them. I'm not offering these people anything different, but if I wanted to say, hey, you know what, Ryan, you could put R50 in the up in the attic, I could punch that in and, and do a better job for them. 
Uh, here's my infiltration values, just like with other software tools, I can punch those infiltration values in. Um, and this is basically going to be how many uh, air changes per hour, so 0 0.6 and 0 0.8 are the defaults in here. Um, this particular house I know is a little bit less. Uh, let's do that. Well, let's do it like that. Make it fair. And I'm going to leave those both the same. They're going to negate out for this purpose, but I'll leave them both the same. If I don't want to put the infiltration air changes in, and I'm actually doing a blower or test on this house, as some of you guys are doing as part of your auditing, um, if you're doing the blower or test, generally I've done at 50 pascals of pressure, which is basically the equivalent of putting like a 20 or 25 mile an hour per wind on this house, and then seeing how much leaks out. Um, by the way, the new state energy code for new construction homes or additions starting January 1st, uh, you have to do blower testing, blower door testing on that stuff to 50 pascals of pressure, and you've got to be five air changes per hour or less at 50 pascals, which, depending on the volume size of the house, is probably going to end up being like, I don't know, 0.1 something or 0.2 air changes per hour in, in, at regular atmospheric pressure. But if I did the blower door test before or after, I can plug those values in. And then I could hit update infiltration values, and it'll go over and override these heating and cooling infiltrations that I had punched in. Um, so that way you can blow a dart us before and after and see that your work actually uh, did, in fact, improve it. Uh, the next little bit of section here, you can define how much square feet you have uh, in specific areas, like over the basement. This is a pretty good guess at my house, which is a two-story house. You saw it was 2,700 square feet. Um, so how much of that is over the basement? You know, basically half. Um, I don't really have anything over unconditioned, everything's over the basement in my house, and even the part that's in a crawl space, the crawl space is conditioned, so that doesn't really have a difference here. So this section is fairly irrelevant, but if you did have it over an unconditioned crawl space, then you can go ahead and say, what's the temperature of that crawl space? How good is the insulation of that floor cavity? And how many square feet does that represent? You can punch those numbers in. Um, if I had a slab on grade, I could do the same thing over there, say how big is the slab? and what's the approximate R value of that floor. And then if my basement's below grade, I can punch that, that data in as well, uh, if it's an unconditioned basement. Um, so that's all that stuff. If I've changed stuff on here, that's going to be my favorite default. Like I always want to offer these people 97% furnaces and things like that. I can click set as default, and it'll make that stuff my default for future use. I'm not going to do that for the moment. I'm just going to leave mine like this. If I were to scroll back up to the top, I can go now and see the effect on all that stuff I just said that I had on my current house. Like now, my now I have a twenty-nine thousand BTU load in my house. If you remember, it started out as like a thirty-some thousand BTU load, um, so it's, it's pretty low cooling load uh, in that house. Um, on the heating side, fifty-six thousand BTUs, which is also fairly low. You saw we started up around eighty before. The biggest thing you're going to see on this software is that you're probably going to see these loads when you do this stuff, and you're going to probably freak out and think that they're too low. Um, the only thing I can say to that is we compare it to other software tools and we get fairly similar results. And the only thing I can guess is that what most people are probably doing is being extremely, extremely conservative on all the stuff they guess at. Because remember, these are existing houses, so you're guessing at insulation values and all that kind of stuff. Now, in my house, I have to know what the insulation values are, so it's easier. But if I didn't, I probably would have guessed conservatively like you would have, and these numbers would have been higher. Um, because I guess the kind of the moral of the story is, as an industry, we kind of grossly oversize HVAC equipment. So the smaller you can get these loads, based on as much data as you can collect, the better. If I just took the default loads out of the software tool, I would end up with equipment that was one or two sizes larger, and I probably can get away with something even smaller. Um, so that's that, I guess. Um, now that I've done all that, I can go back here and look at it and say, well, how realistic are these costs? Cooling, 100 bucks. Heating's a thousand bucks. In reality, my heating bills last year for my gas, for the heating portion of my gas, were six hundred and some dollars last year. So I know that this is even high compared to what I really have. So I could even tweak this guy even further, and you can see that my operating load's even reducing. So let's say it's six hundred and ninety just for that point. So now it's forty-four thousand BTU load. It's basically half of what I started with. Um, so not only can I go in and punch in all the values of these people's houses that I know, but then I can also adjust the slide bars for heating and cooling here till the bills line up with whatever bills they can produce. So maybe they don't have 12 months of bills because people typically don't have all that sitting around, but they probably got November because November just happened. 
So I can try to get these curves to kind of line up. So if November was, right now it says November 78 bucks. Well, if the November bill was, you know, 110 bucks, I can go move the slide bar to say that they use more energy and it adjusts the whole curve here. Um, so it is kind of a nice tool in that regard. Like I said, though, I like to go in and plug in all the values that I can find, like what's their thermostat set on? That should be pretty easy. I can walk up to it and look at that, right? And what's the AFUE of their equipment and what kind of insulation do they have? If I don't know, I'll probably just leave the defaults, but find as much of it as you can. And then when you come back and adjust this curve, you're kind of starting off at a much more accurate point to begin with. So when you adjust it, it kind of tweaks a little bit better for those bills. Um, then as I scroll down all the way to the bottom here, uh, it tells me my, my basic usage. Let's see, we had a question from Bob. Is a condition basement included in the total square footage you, be, you began with? Uh, it was not. My square footage, uh, we started out at 2,700 square feet. And that was first floor and second floor and was not including the basement. Uh, generally speaking, for load calcs in general, uh, for s basements below grade, I traditionally have not done much, if anything, for plugging in basement data um, because the load is fairly minimal. Uh, I mean, you basically have, you know, five feet of dirt as your insulation around the house. But if you wanted to specify more square footage in here, so a square foot of basement below the grade, let's say that it's 1,000 square feet. Obviously, it'd be the same before and after. I'm not, I'm not digging my basement out. Uh, now I can go back up and see the effect on that that it had. It basically changed my heating bill by 50 bucks. Who said it was 690? So it went up a little bit, but it has pretty minimal effect. The basement does a conditioned basement does. Um, Bob also asked how many years of weather data is it using to average out to calculate the operating costs. Um, I don't believe that this software or any of the other op energy tools that we use, like uh, Elite and those tools, are using uh, uh, actual weather data. What they're using is uh, the data from the ASHRAE handbook, um, which I don't know what that's based on. I guess we could look that up and see what that data is based on. But we use the typical 8,760 hours of bin data from ASHRAE to calculate for any given zip code or any given geographic region what the weather pattern is. But whether they base that on 30 years of data or 20 or 50, I'm not, I'm not sure how many years of data that ASHRAE bases it on. But it's using the 8,760 bin hour data um, for that specific region, in our case, the Chicago airport data for this particular zip code. All right, so down at the bottom, uh, like I said, you can also do combustion testing in and out. It doesn't have any effect on the energy ratings or load counts for this house. Uh, but if I were to click that, it gives me some tables I can fill out for my combustion testing. And then later on, when I do print my report, that information will be on there. Uh, we're not going to do that for today's purposes. Um, so here's the basic reports. It has the first section, and, and I'll show you the PDF printout of this stuff as well. It's like a six-page report that pops out. Um, but it's estimating the cost of operating this house is $2,400. I look at their utility bill. I can say, yeah, that's about right, or no, that's wrong. Um, if I do the stuff that I improved on, in this case, put in 97% furnace, basically, here's how much I could expect to save by doing that. So and th on this tool, we call it heat bleed. Kind of the idea of the way this data is being presented, and this same chart shows up in the consumer's printout, uh, is to show them the cost of not doing anything. Hey, if you don't do anything, you're going to continue to waste this 237 bucks. Now, in this case, it wasn't very much because the utility bills were fairly low, um, but with bigger houses where they're paying you know, $5,000 of gas and electric costs a year, or older houses where they have those bills, then the cost of doing nothing sometimes is over $1,000, and it's a little more interesting. This house I chose to use just happens to be uh, a 10-year-old house, so it's not, it's not, it's pretty reasonably efficient. Um, then down here, you get a breakdown of the individual things that we had picked and how much it would save. Uh, so just doing the heating system would have saved 110 bucks. Uh, doing the water heater would save 80 bucks a year. Um, the insulation improvements, I think all we said was go from R30 to R50 on the attic. It would be this much. The cooling system in this particular case, because the cooling requirement was so low and it already had a 14 sear, pretty much the cooling system, system doesn't do any savings to go from a 14 to 16 sear. Um, we didn't do any of the other improvements. We said you know before and after would be the same, but if I listed them out, uh, it would have had an effect on these numbers here. Um, 
So, and it's just a matter of, you know, just based on how, how much this house was using to begin with. If this house was using a lot more energy, let's say the same person owned my house, but they didn't have the aggressive setback that I have, they didn't have the zoning system that I have, et cetera, and their bill was on the higher end. Let's say they're spending more for heating, right? I'll go down and look at the answers then, because that guy's using a lot more. Now, instead of wasting 300 bucks a year, he's wasting 1000 bucks a year, because he's got much higher set points for heating and things like that. Um, the last section down here of what you can do before you print the report. <laughs> Chris typed in that that you can do all this work for my house for uh, for 10k, so that's about a 42 year payback. Uh, I might take him up on that. 42 year payback sounds pretty decent. Um, like I said, the, the 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 house is not that old, so it's reasonably well efficient, and and I manage it like a crazy man, so it is pretty cheap utility bills, but that's not everybody's house. Everybody's house is different, obviously. Um, now, when my furnace, if my furnace dies to put in a new one, yeah, now, I'm, now it's not a 42-year payback because i got to buy a new furnace anyway, so I'm going to buy the crappy one or I'm going to buy the new one. I only got to do the payback based on that. So speaking of payback, I can put some of the costs in for some of these things here. Um, so one of the things that um, we said we wanted to improve was the heating system, right? So um, Let's just say, for sake of this discussion, let's say putting in that new furnace is five thousand dollars. I'm just making up a number here. So I punch that number in, uh, and it's going to show me over here my first year return on investment is basically worth four point eight percent. It's not showing me payback, but I think you can see the payback's pretty long, right? And payback's not always the best way to sell something like this because the paybacks are longer. Uh, but if I'm paying five thousand dollars and I'm only going to save two hundred forty dollars. You can tell the payback's going to be 20 years in this case. Now, if somebody else is going to get $1,000 savings on their heating system, he's going to get a five-year payback for the same furnace. So it just kind of depends. Um, but this tool specifically does not show payback for a reason, although you can quickly calculate it between these two numbers. It shows return on investment. Um, return on investment is a metric we frequently use in commercial projects as well um, to kind of explain to someone, hey, in this case, if you put this new furnace in, this 97% furnace, and throw away your 80%, -er, it's going to cost you this much, it's going to save you that much, it's returning 4.8%. If you have somewhere better, like your savings account, to put your money and get 4.8%, God bless you. Go ahead and do it. But if you don't, go ahead and buy the new furnace because it's going to get you a better rate of return. That's kind of the logic with doing it this way to make those cases. Right? Same with the water heater. If the new water heater is going to cost me, I don't know, two grand, and I'm once again making up numbers, it's going to be a 3.9% return on investment. Right? So I can do that for these various pieces here. What else do we have? Cooling system. I'm not even going to bother because it was only nine bucks. Uh, and if I do the air sealing, I don't know what that costs, but let's say it costs fifteen hundred bucks to do duct sealing and uh, and uh, why well, I, oh, I had insulation in there. That's what this one was. I didn't do any duct sealing on the system efficiency, so that was insulation. I don't know what that costs either, but let's say it's fifteen hundred bucks. So it's going to be you know a uh, five percent return on investment. Um, down here, I can put the total of what I was proposing. So what did we have? Um, we had a 97% furnace. We had the, uh, the insulation, right? So 5,000 and a water here, 2,000. So 5 and 2 is 7 plus 1,500, 8,500. So there's my total, 8,500. I didn't pick the air conditioner because it didn't make sense for this consumer. So $8,500 total cost. Um, if they're going to get a loan or something like that, if there's any rebates, I can plug those in. So this one happens to be a Nikkor. It happens to be a $500 rebate on the furnace and 300 on the water here so I can put $800 for the rebate in there. All that's going to basically do is reduce my uh, effective cost um, downward. Right? So it was zero. Right? You see the numbers over there, first year savings and those numbers are changing. So instead of four, oops, $403, I'm sorry, not the, um, down here, the return on investment changing. So 4.7% return on investment originally after the utility rebate. Instead of 4.7, it's uh, well, should, didn't just say 5.2. What am I looking at here? Wait a minute, got myself lost here. Maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not waiting long enough before I keep changing the number. We'll let it recalculate. There we go. Now it's 5.2. All right, so 4.7 to 5.2 after the utility rebate um, showed me my savings over the time here. If I was going to get a loan or something like that, 
let's say I was getting a loan for 8,000 of it. And let's say, what's the current uh, on bill? I can't do that on by bill financing because I don't have an air conditioner, do I? So let's just say this is the five-year loan, 7% rate. Now I'll calculate my monthly payment for me um, to tell me what the holding's going to be. So my monthly payment is going to be uh, $92 a month to pay for this $8,500 system with $500 down. I'm going to save $33 on a month on my gas bill, um, in this case for my water heater and my furnace. So it's basically really only costing me 59 bucks a month. That's kind of how that's going. Um, so down here, it just gives you a little reminder for the consumer. Hey, we're, you're losing 404 bucks on this house. I can get proposal by clicking this button here. And my web browser puts a little funny thing on the bottom here. I got to uh, I got to get out of this full screen mode. There we go. All right, now when I click proposal, I should get the little pop up box thing. So I'll go to my, there you go. So now I can see my pop-up box, which I couldn't see before. I can either open it or save it onto my computer. I'm just going to open it in this case. It'll open up as a PDF. So here's the PDF. It basically has the same information, but presented a little bit better for the consumer. So expand that out a little bit. So up in the top is the consumer's name and address and contact info, basic square footage of their house. Down here is who did the audit. So this is you in this case. And any certification logos you have. In my case, it was LEED and ASHRAE, but you could also have BPI or ResNet or whatever the other logo choices were that applied to you. Up in the very top, it basically tells you how much you're wasting a year by not doing the stuff that we're recommending. In this case, 400 bucks a year is being wasted. Uh, there's some little descriptions on what some of these things mean here for the consumer. And then we got some data on the house. So on the left is the current house. On the right is the proposed house. So... You can see here of what you're actually changing. Oh, we're putting in more ceiling, you know, attic insulation. Great. Right? All these other things are the same right now. Boom, 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 boom. I didn't do any air sealing type stuff, just the insulation in this example. Uh, how much is my cooling cost now? How much is it going to cost? How much is my heating? How much is it going to cost? Same for the water heating on its way down. Uh, it gives me those same graphs I showed you before. What are you doing now? Pink is heating. Blue is cooling. Light blue is water heating. Yellow is electric. In our case, we said we're leaving all electric the same. And here's this little hashed, hatched area is what's being wasted. Um, the solutions are presented in order of dollars. So in this particular case, I mean, it's based on what I had put in for recommendations. I only basically said do heating, water heating, and insulation. So those are the ones that are listed here. But if I said to do duct sealing or put new windows in or whatever, then I would have data there as well. I just chose not to do that in this example. So there's how much I saved for my furnace, my water heater, my attic insulation, and then my uh, my cooling savings if I chose the cooling option, which I didn't. All right. So that just gives me a little bit better breakdown of some of this data individually, how much each one of them is going to save and what the paybacks are. So it's all the same data you saw a minute ago. It's just presented in a uh, you know pr printable report you can get for them. And then here's how much we said we're going to pay for the whole thing, how much is my loan going to be, what's my interest rate, my monthly payment's 93 bucks. Um, I'm saving 33 bucks a month, etc. And then if you want the further data on there based on how these loads are basically calculated, basically all my inputs for both the current and the retrofit, you can come down here and see all those input data. So that way you can see basically that no one's playing any funny games. Oh, I didn't get your savings because I said you're not going to have this be your set point anymore. You're going to have this other fake set point. I didn't trick it out. Everything's straight up. So you can give them both the inputs on, on the current and the proposed solution and see these things all the way down through. Okay, and the same thing on the cooling side of the equation. Um, specifically, where am I losing my energy for cooling? Ceilings, walls, windows, etc. People. So you can see the breakdown of the cooling loads. You can see it graphically. In this case, it's basically the same because I didn't really do anything with the air conditioner. Um, and then my uh, my sensible and cooling data, heating and cooling. That's the end of my report. So really the first couple of pages are the most interesting to the consumer, but if they want more information, this is where we can kind of scroll down and give them the rest of it. This is just a PDF so you can, you know, go print it anywhere you want kind of thing. 
All right, so let me see if anybody else has any questions they've typed in. I guess I low bid it. Chris, Chris was going to do it for 10K. I said 8,500. So you guys should use me instead of Chris as your installer. You'll save 1,500 bucks. Uh, I don't see any other questions on there right now. Um, because we have a few minutes, let me just go over to the load calc ones just so you can kind of see that and just see what might be the same versus different. So I'm going to just punch in the same house for the sake of this discussion. I'm not going to take the time to to go in and uh, and change all the values like I did on this one just because you already see how that basically works. Well, instead of hitting home auditor, I'm going to uh, hit the load calculator. So it does the same kind of thing. It uses the address to go find the house, does the basic load based on what it could find. I can go ahead and pick you know, with the glass exposure that I want, adjust my sun loads and my actual load of my house, etc. I can put in more information about this house if I know it. Uh, so the square footage, for example, I can type in differently. Uh, same kind of thing, I can punch in the age of the house. I can punch in my utility costs. Uh, I'm not going to do all that now, just for the sake of time. Um, my indoor and outdoor design temperatures, you can see once again, it pulled 89 for cooling um, and 3 degrees for heating. Um, and then indoor temperatures, I can change to match what these people really do at their house, etc. Uh, but it's basically all the same information, and I can just tweak it just like I tweaked on the other tool. Um, and it's going to do the manual J in the background to figure all this stuff out. And I can do the individual floor data. So to Bob's question, you know, the basement, do I include it or not include it? It's up to you. It has minimal effect. Um, but I can punch that in if it's a conditioned basement, etc. Put their information in. And I'm just going to leave all that as is and hit get proposal just so you can see the output of that guy. I'll open that guy up. Uh, so this guy's a five-page report. It gives me some basic information about the house and where it is. I didn't even bother punching in my contact info, but it would have showed up there if I did. Here's what I based my calculation on on the house for its wall values and so forth. All right, my design conditions, indoor and outdoor. So these are my input screens, basically. Here's my actual outputs for my loads. So here's my heating loads. Page three, page four is my cooling loads. So I can see both my sensible and latent cooling load. Um, that's kind of how that guy goes along. So fairly similar to what we were doing um, with the other tool. Uh, it's doing the same kind of thing. It's just that the energy auditor tool is basically doing two manual J calculations at the same time. One for your current house, just like this one just did, and one for the proposed house. So it's kind of nice you do them both at the same time, side by side, and you can really see the effect of an individual improvement and how it will help that particular person. Um, all right, so that's the load calc here. And this is the same kind of report you would print off and um, submit for your, in this case, you see down here, for your federal or your state code requirements because load calculations are required by Illinois state code starting in January. So this would be one way you could do that. Or you can use your regular load calc program. A uh, question from Bill is, where is it going to tell you where the manual J printout for the village? This is the, this is the load calc output. So this is the five pages that you would submit uh, as your load calculation to the village or county or whoever it is you're submitting data to. So here's your total loads right here. Sensible cooling, latent cooling, sensible heating. All right, so those, excuse me, those four right there are your outputs from the manual J calculation. So that's what you would be submitting is these, these pages here. This is the final output page, but chances are you're probably going to submit all five because they're going to want to see what it was based on, um, this input data. If you were doing the uh, this proposal we did before with the energy one, it's the same information that's on here. It's just you're getting everything twice, right? Before and, and uh, excuse me, before and after calculations. Um, that would probably confuse them, so I don't know that I would use this one for the village because they would be seeing two load calcs side by side, and they'd be like, what the heck is that? Um, so this is really more for the homeowner to see what the improvements are going to be made. But if you're just looking to get your um, village approval, I would use the regular load calc one where it just has one load calc at a time. Bill's question is, does it say ACCA Manual J actually on here? That is a good question. I don't know that it says it on the report. 
It doesn't say it, but I'll ask them if they can add that on here to make it a little bit easier. Because it doesn't actually say that on the report anywhere. Just this generic verbiage. So we'll ask about that one, Bill. Uh, Chris asked the question if we can use this for new construction. Um, and the answer would be no, because the step one is finding the address. And for new construction, it's not going to find the address. Or it's going to find some farmland when you're really building a subdivision. So, you know, this particular tool, the energy uh, auditor tool, and I guess the load calc tool as well, would be only for existing, not for new construction. For new construction, you're going to have to use one of the regular tools like uh, WriteSoft or Lead or something like that and uh, build it up from scratch because um, there's no data to go pull from the tax records and so forth. Uh, he asked if you could just enter a, a random address and adjust all the numbers. And, yeah, you could do that, Chris. Uh, I don't see any reason why you couldn't put in a different or nearby address and then go and tweak everything. Um, you can do that. Because every, every one of the values is adjustable. As long as you get the right zip code uh, to get the right weather profile, that should be fine. And you'll have to go in and adjust the square footage, adjust all the insulation values, etc. But that should work, I would think, Chris. Uh, Jim is asking who this is mandatory for. Um, when you say this, I assume you mean load calcs in general, not necessarily this software tool. Load calcs are mandatory starting on January 1st for all projects in the state of Illinois. So every residential home you do, that's either new construction, uh, remodel, renovation, retrofit, alteration, repair, or replacement. So basically anytime you touch anything, you're going to have to do a load calc. So if you change somebody's furnace out, uh, you're going to have to submit a load calc to comply with the state of Illinois energy code. It's a statewide energy code, and we already have a statewide energy code. It's just that the new one starting in January requires load calculations, residentially speaking. Commercial's already recorded for a few years. Um, so it's a statewide energy code, but each municipality is responsible for enforcing it in their jurisdiction. So depending on the town you're in, it'll determine how strict they enforce it. Um, there's some places you know, like Chicago, Oak Park, Naperville. You know those folks on January 1 if you're looking for the load calc on the permit application. Um, there's other towns that may not even realize there is a new energy code in the state. It'll just depend. But it's required for everybody on all projects. If you put a new furnace, air conditioner, uh, any of that kind of stuff, you're going to have to have to do a load calculation. Uh, Bill asks uh, that they've run into, or some more comment. he's run into issues with it not saying ACA on the actual printout. Um, asking if we can get that on there. I will make that request to the software guys um, if they can put the ACA logo or, or verbiage that says manual J or something like that on there um, to make it easier with the villages. So if you have a village like that in the meantime, Bill, until this report says it, uh, you'd have to continue using your normal load calculation tools. Uh, Christine asks, uh, said that we mentioned that the software developer prefers Firefox, um, but obviously I'm running it on Internet Explorer today. Will it work on Safari, and can you use it on iPad? Uh, yes, it'll work on Safari, and yes, you can use it on iPad. I don't have an Apple computer, but I do have an iPad, and I have run this software tool on here before. I've never done the load calc one. I've only done the energy auditor, but since it's the same thing, basically, I assume the, uh, I assume the load calc one would work also. Um, and then as far as a Mac computer goes, uh, it should work on Safari. I don't have it to test it, but Safari, that's the, that's the browser you're using on iPad, so if it works on iPad, you got to think it would also work on a Mac computer. Um, but you definitely do the energy audit on iPad because I've done that several times before. All right, do we have any other questions? We're right here at 1 o'clock. I'll stay on the line for another minute or two to see if anybody else punches a question in. Um, and we did record this, so it should be posted in the next few hours on the website. If someone else in your office wants to watch the recorded version, just let me know and I'll send you the link. Uh, I also think that you'll probably get a link automatically emailed to you from the, from the uh, GoToMeeting service, but just in case, I can send it to you. Um, I think we're pretty good. So I'll just stay on the line for another minute or two in case somebody does have a question. Otherwise, thank you guys for coming. And, uh, and this is uh, actually our last webinar for the year. So we'll be starting webinars again um, the first week of January. So have a good holiday, and uh, we'll talk to you guys when you uh, come back from the holiday. Thanks. Bye.